to mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Tonight, Rishi Sunak survives Christmas after his Rwanda plan got voted through. But what lies in wait for the Prime Minister in the new year? I'll be joined by Dame Andrea Jenkins, who has already submitted a letter of no confidence. Sir Keir Starmer makes the pitch to be the country's next Prime Minister, but... Is he ready to be handed the keys to number 10? And David Cameron says the heat and the anger have gone from our relationship with the EU. But will he, the Remainer, take us back in? Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. For the moment, at least, the Prime Minister can breathe a sigh of relief. A defeat at the second reading of his flagship Rwanda plan would have meant huge questions for his premiership and for the party. Luckily for him, that didn't happen because the bill passed on Tuesday with a majority of 44, which means for now it's still moving forward. But while Rishi Sunak lives to fight another day, what awaits him in the new year? with so many MPs abstaining from that vote, likely to demand big changes. While others will insist it doesn't change at all, 2024 could be his biggest headache yet. With me in the studio to go over all of that and more are policy and politics correspondent at the New Statesman, Zoe Grunwald, and the author and broadcaster, Matthew Stadlin. Zoe, what did you make of what happened during the week on that vote? Well, it's been a tricky week for Sunak, hasn't it? Um, he really is stuck between a rock and a hard place. So on the one hand, he has the right of his party who want to see this legislation go much further. And he might have satiated them with bacon sandwiches at breakfast, but they are absolutely going to want concessions in the new year on this piece of legislation. There is no way that they just agreed to back down um, for, Sunak's, for Sunak's pride or his policy. Um, they're going to expect more in the new year. But as you say, on the other hand, we've got the, the One Nation Conservative group, the moderates in the party, who are very, very keen not to see the government take the country out of the European Convention on Human Rights. So what we're going to see in the new year is a battle between uh, Sunak and his party. And he might have survived this round of battling, but I think it's going to get very bleak indeed for him. So very well put, because um, the, the right wing of the party, which is now split into a number of groups, this is a battle for... It's a battle now for the, like, the heart and soul mm -hmm. of the Conservative Party. Because if the right wing is if the ERG and the New Conservatives and the Common Sense Group and all the others who are, are in those individual groupings, if they lose, then they lose all of their credibility. And Sunak actually has won. And they really don't have a leg to stand on moving forward. That's it. The sting will have been removed from their tail. Mm. And so it really will be a fight to the death in the new year. Matthew, what do you think? What's your take on this? This week could have gone so much worse, I think, for Rishi Sunak, because he was up in front of the COVID inquiry. That passed off without major incident or major headline. And then he won this first of a series of potentially crucial votes. The right of his party for the moment have been silenced, but as you both say, we'll see what happens in the new year. The problem for the Conservatives, for your, for your party, Nadine, is on the one hand, they know almost certainly that under Sunak's leadership, they are going to crash to electoral disaster. But they also know that if they tear each other apart, as they've been threatening to do, it could be even worse for them, because who wants a party to govern the country when it can't be united uh, itself? But you're not factoring into the fact into that, the fact that they've already kind of like factored that in. They know it's over. So in, now it's not about whether they win the election or not. Now it's about who who is in charge moving forward. 
Who is it who grasps hold? What is the Conservative Party about? Is it on the right? Well, is it on the left? I think it's a bit, is it a one nation group uh, that wins? Is that the party that moves forward into a manifesto to I think election? There's a bit more of a dilemma that some of these MPs are facing because you still have Boris Johnson saying it's not totally total disaster for Sunak. He could still turn it round, and there will be those voices in their ears as they seek to rebel or consider rebelling that say, hang on just a moment. Maybe we could scrape through. Maybe, maybe this will be more like 1992. And those voices may quell the rebellion, but we'll see. And that's why the early weeks and early months of next year are so critical. Oh, that's, that's, that's very true. It's, um, do you think, so quick bet, Zoe, do you think that who will, who will win in the new year? Do you think Sunak will survive? Will it be the One Nation group? Will it be those on the right? I think Sunak will survive because I think changing leaders now would be electoral oblivion. Um, and I think there are far more members in the party who at least want to try and fight their seat with a bit of dignity than to go out in a blaze of conservative infighting. Um, so I do think Sunak will So survive. hang on a second, we've just got, so Mark Francois on the right, can we just have a listen to what he had mm. to say? We have decided collectively that we cannot support the bill tonight. At the committee stage, we will aim to table amendments which would, we hope, if accepted, materially improve the bill. We very much hope that at committee those amendments may yet be accepted. If they are not, and the bill remains unamended in that way. Again, collectively, we agreed to reserve the right to vote against it at third reading. So, Matthew, I just the right on the party aren't going anywhere. They think... are determined. Every one of those MPs I know personally, I know well, they aren't going anywhere. They are not backing down. They can't back down because if they do, if they back down, that, that's it, they've lost. It means that the heart of soul, that what goes into our manifesto, what decides the future of the Conservative Party will be dictated by the One Nation group, which is on the left of the party. They will lose all power and all credibility. They will just not let that I, happen. I just don't think Marc Francois is a, a sufficiently plausible leader of a serious he rebellion. He was a spokesperson. But... He, was a spokes he, was a, he was a spokesperson. He was the person who led the rebellion on Brexit. But you had, other big, you had other big beasts involved then. And they're still involved I, there. I'm, well, where are the Jacob Rees Moggs now? L listen, I, I want to know what you think, because to my mind, Sunak will scrape this Rwanda bill through. I think it's a disgraceful bill. I think he's been a disastrous prime minister. I'm on the left. You are on the right. You're, as we just established last week, you and Rishi Sunak are not on each other's Christmas card list. What do you want going forward? Would you be prepared to see five years of a Rishi Sunak-led... Tory government, another five years? No. So will you be voting Labour, Nadine? Well, in the next well, I, well, Matthew, I think I'm in the chair. <laughs> I think you're on the panel. I ask the questions. What will you be voting, Matthew? I'll, I'll be <laughs> voting Labour, but I'm curious to know, do you, do, is your dislike of Sunak such and what he, you think no, he stands for look, look, that I'm, you would switch I'm not the horses. person being questioned here. And we've got 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 months to go, possibly, until there will could be, be an election. It could be more, could be January 2025. So, as I said last week, we've got until January 2025 to go. I don't think, I think it would look really bad if the party went to the wire. I mean, it would look desperate. Mm. The last person to do that was Gordon Brown, and it looked desperate. Well, we they just are knew. desperate. They are desperate. Yeah, well, well, yeah, Zoe. Do you think Mark Francois looked like he was serious? Well, I think he looks like he's serious, but I don't think he is a... I completely agree with Matthew. I don't think he's a credible leader. Um, I don't actually see a credible leader in there, and I think that's probably Sunak's best bet, is that there is no alternative to Sunak that looks reasonable so, no, at the moment. No, 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 no. Mark Francois is not in contention for the leader of the oh, Conservative I know. Yes. Party. I think a bigger point here is, you know, we've, we've lost our big beasts in Westminster, so in removing Boris Johnson, you can see the kind of the emergence of Nigel Farage as somebody mm. people are talking mm. about to be integrated into or take over the party. So I think I said this last week, I'm very sure that Richard Tice very soon, probably in the new year, will stand aside and uh, very happily and let, and let Nigel Farage take over the reins 
of reform. And I think the explosion point, the kind of like the tinderbox being fired, I think that's going to happen when the Conservative Party, if like the red line is below 20%. So if we fall below 20% and the red line on reform is if reform go above 15 and we go below 20, then that is going to be a tinderbox being fired Just off. On this and there'll be a really interesting conversations then about what happens and, and who is Nigel Farage and will he be the leader of, for our, of reform and will conversations be taking place? But the polls haven't shifted mm. enough yet. We need to go down a bit, reform need to go up a bit and you'll see some, I think, fascinating conversations take place then. Well, I think you're right on Farage. I don't think he's going to go anywhere near the Conservative Party. I think Richard Tice... Richard Tice said in his own words. Richard Tice, he did go to the Tory party conference, of course. And he said R in his own words this week R that it's not, it's not out of the question. Well, I think, well, I think you're right that Richard Tice may well stand aside. Uh, Richard Tice is determined to hammer the Tories. And it is such an important difference from 2019, as we keep saying, when Nigel Farage stood down all those candidates in Tory winnable seats and helped deliver that 80 seat majority to Boris Johnson and to you guys. That's not going to happen this time round. I, I'm not sure reform will get up to 15%, but if Farage takes over the reins, you can't rule it out. And no, that would exactly. be a, that would be a crushing defeat for the Tories. He's completely reinvented himself, whatever you may think, through the coot scandal, the removal of Dame Alison Rose, the uh, I'm a celebrity, he's suddenly a, a different person. And I think that was all deliberate and it's all been done to kind of like reinvent Nigel Farage. So here's a question. Do you think Nigel Farage could become Prime Minister? No. no. <laughs> he's, he's tried seven times to become an MP and he's failed every single time. It's not going to happen, but he is a disruptor and he's an mm. extremely effective politician and that's why the Tories I are terrified of him. I disagree with you. I think we are in such a dire state, I think. And I don't think you can judge what's happened in the past because here's the point. If Boris Johnson was still... There are two big beasts in the Westminster jungle. One is Boris Johnson, one is Nigel Farage. When Boris Johnson led the Conservative Party, he neutered Nigel Farage. Nigel Farage just couldn't break through the Boris Johnson bubble. Now there is no Boris Johnson. Nigel Farage is the only big beast left. Keir Starmer certainly isn't. But you've just said Rishi that Tice will step isn't. aside so that Farage can lead reform. Yes, exactly. If he does that, he's not going to be joining the Tories. So, ab ab well, you don't know what deal will happen between the Conservatives and the Reform Party, if if they're moving towards being neck and neck in the polls, you have no idea. Why would the right not unite? Isn't it astonishing that we're even this having this conversation? Well, well, is it astonishing we're having this conversation that the Tories are so desperate yeah. that they might be yeah, considering taking Nigel Farage yeah. back in? I think we also need to account for the fact that we are talking a lot about the right of the Conservative Party at the minute, and they are the loudest, most dominant force at the minute in the Conservative Party. But you do have about a third of the Conservative Party sat in the One Nation caucus. You have a lot of moderates who are getting increasingly annoyed with the way the Conservative Party is moving. You've got actually quite a lot of big beasts, Conservative MPs who can be household names, who have thus far stayed pretty silent, but will not tolerate leaving international law for many so one nation who are you talking about well i'm i'm you know i'm thinking about um well, david cameron D yeah david cameron oh, who's come back on. as Jeremy foreign Hunt. secretary Jeremy and so Hunt. why one was of he the brought problems. back as foreign secretary well oh well, my gosh that's that's a whole segment that's a whole segment <laughs> to talk about <laughs> we'll, david we'll cameron and why and how he came back yeah. but here's one problem with that section of the party that you're talking about they they you you describe them as moderates they're not all moderates these are part of the group that think a woman can have a penis and so there are dividing lines between these groups within the party which just it's like oil and water they just can't mix when it comes to various You're talking ideologies about the party of government it's yeah. damning and it's too broad church so coming up let's move break Dame Andrew Jenkins gives her take on Rishi's future after submitting a vote of no confidence in the prime minister Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. 
The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back to Friday Night with Nadine. Rishi Sunak has made it to the new year at the very least, but I doubt he'll be having a very relaxing Christmas. The party stands divided and on the brink of civil war over concessions to the Rwanda bill, with his demise all but assured if it gets it wrong, if he gets it wrong. But is the Prime Minister already living on borrowed time? Joining me live is Conservative MP Dame Andrea Jenkins, who submitted a note of no confidence in Rishi Sunak a month ago. And Andrea, I think you're probably not the only one. So how do you think Rishi is going to do in the new year? What do you think is going to happen? Well, conversations I've had, Nadine, with, um, with our colleagues, um, I've been told 22 are in, um, but these are obviously only the ones who's told me, So, um, which obviously means it's a lot more. I do think that Rishi is living on borrowed time. Um, I, I think that they, the, the right of the party are giving... Rishi the chance to try and amend the bill, but the Rwanda bill, which I don't think he will. Um, so I think he's just kicking the can down the road. Uh, but I think that the right of the party be ready to um, vote against it. I'm, I know that I certainly am um, when it comes back in January. So I do predict um, that we will have a new leader before the next election. Yeah. So isn't it interesting, Andrea, over on the right of the party, because, so, you know, I've been in Westminster for 25 years and we always boast about what a broad church the Conservative Party is and how everybody's entitled to their opinion. But what I see now are various parties within the party. I mean, the five groups... We've got a bunch of Lib Dems, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, well, we have. We've got Lib Dem MPs, they're in the One Nation group and we've got, you know, reform MPs on the right of the party. So, yes. so what, how, how do you think those five... Why do we have five groupings on the right, Andrea? Why aren't we just one? Why aren't they? Why aren't you just one group? Why is it five groups? I, I agree with you. Um, I mean, it's five groups probably because there's... Well, I mean, it, it's... If you look at the different five different factions, it's, you know, some is about growth, some is about um, Brexit. So um, there's, a whole, there's obviously the Northern Research Group about the North, 
but we do come together on key um, matters such as Brexit, such as um, the likes of um, taxation as well, and also um, on the Rwanda bill and immigration. Now, what I think we need to do, Nadine, I do think it's time for a new leader. Look, we've got nothing to lose. To, um, I heard your guests earlier say about um, it, it would be ludicrous to have a new leader now. Well, I, I don't think it will be. We've got nothing to lose. We need to bite the bullet. Yes, it means a general election will come sooner, but you know if they can have three months bedding in. Um, but as you said as well, Nadine, um, there's no big personalities like Boris. I mean, I've tweeted twice this week, bring back Boris, especially when we looked at the anniversary of the 2019 election. And look, Nigel Farage didn't get um, any, any seats, as we know, um, then. And I just think we, we need to bite the bullet. We need a new leader. I'd love to see Boris come back, but um, if he doesn't come back, um, I think the right need to unite behind. But you one know, person. Andrea, and I'll certainly be pushing. But you know, but party bosses have said they will block him coming back, so there's no chance of Boris coming back for an election. So I always ask the question: Who are these party bosses? And of course, the, the faceless, yeah. unelected people that mm. like I wrote about in my book, the plot. I've detailed who yes. they all are, but these are the people who will block him from coming back. And so there will be no bias. But the interesting thing is, as Boris said also this week, he did say that Rishi could turn it around. That's because Boris mm -hmm. turned it around in six months. If we remember when he took over from Theresa May after that disastrous yeah. 2017 election, he turned it all around in six months. But that's because he's one of those big political beasts. Rishi Sunak exactly. can't turn it around in six months. And I think when Boris talked about turning it around, he was projecting his own skills and, and skill sets yes. and his own charisma and his own pull with the British people onto Rishi Sunak. And of course, it's just not there. So the chance of Rishi turning it around is, you know, is, is wishful zilch. thinking. Zilch. Completely zilch. It is zilch. Yeah. Do you know where we were just two points behind with Boris as the leader and we had a massive majority. Mm. And so tell me, Andrea, because I know from, you know, the conversations I've had, is it true that Conservative MPs are, have got seller's remorse? Are they regretting ousting Boris Johnson? I mean, I think when you see this week that one of the deputy chairman of the party um, is saying that he regrets, um, uh, you know, asking Boris to resign at the time, and he's one of the prime ministers, you know, one of Rishi's deputy of the party, I think that speaks volumes, don't you, Nadine? So there needs to be a lot of work in Westminster from MPs for him to come back. Oh, yes. definitely. And and while um, we've got his um, his attack dog of our chairman in um, in the CCHQ, if you remember, um, Richard was the one who really did this campaign against Liz Truss and her economic policy. So Rishi has got one of his his people as party chairman at the moment. And we're not going to get um, past him to get Boris in. Um, but this is why we need to sort of time it um, quite well. We need to get rid of, um, of Rishi sooner rather than later. We've got some bi potential by-elections coming up. And we've just got to go for it. Or um, the other thing is we need to, the right need to unite behind one candidate. And I'll certainly be pushing for that, definitely. That's great. Andrea, lovely to see you again and um, have a great Christmas and I hope to see you soon. Same to you. Thank you. So still with me in the studio to go over all of that and much more, our policy and politics correspondent, the New Statement, Zoe Grunwald, and the author and broadcaster, Matthew Stadlin. So, what? I'm, I'm just astonished by this exchange. <laughs> yeah. I'm just thinking, you've got two Conservatives, one former Secretary of State, one Tory MP, who are talking about getting rid of another Conservative Prime Minister, when we've already had two since Boris Johnson was the Prime Minister when we had the last general election. So that would make four in total going into another election. And I can hear people again shouting at their TV sets and think, look, take, get your own room, guys. We're, we're talking about a country and a cost of living crisis mm -hmm. where a lot really? of people think there's an immigration crisis. I don't, but lots of people do. Get your act together. Stop fighting and plotting and You don't think whinging. a million people over the past year, you don't think a, an influx 
of the number, the size of the city of Leeds. You don't think it's that's... absolutely irrelevant whether I think it or well, not. That's because a you're lot not of, struggling a, a lot to of, get no, a GP no, appointment no, I'm or to get yourself I'm a house it's, or to get a job. Isn't I'm saying it, it's irrelevant that I, what, what I think. What matters is what people out there think, and a lot of people do think there's a crisis, and they think that the government has abysmally failed to get a grip on that crisis. And here are two conservatives talking about getting rid of yet another leader. Mm. And I think no thanks. We want nothing to do with that. We're going to vote elsewhere. Yeah. I think what's very clear is that the Conservative Party could probably benefit from some time in opposition. Yeah. Get their act together, figure out what it is they stand for. Bringing back a Prime Minister who has been forced to resign his post, who lied to the country, who it was his time to go. Is there no more talent in the Conservative Party that you have to bring him back? This so is I, a party I, that's on the side. I will disagree with you, with you, obviously, on the point that he lied to the country, but you're absolutely right about the opposition. And, and I think the big question is not should the Conservative Party be in opposition, it deserves to be in opposition. The question is, how can the Conservative Party organise itself enough so that its time in opposition is only five years and not 15? That is actually the question. The Conservative Party is in an existential crisis at the moment. The question is, how do we minimise that damage? And how do we get ourselves to a position five years after an election to deserve to win the trust and the votes of the British people. Because right now we don't. Right now we don't deserve to be in power. Right now we deserve, and if there is somebody else who comes in, we deserve to go to general election. But Nadine, That's far be it from me to be giving the Conservatives advice, but surely that is a question. I'd agree on that point, Matthew. <laughs> we can agree there. <laughs> surely that is a question for after the next election. It would be bonkers beyond belief to get rid of Sunak now. Yes, you're going to be defeated, but so, no, I... No, sorry, I, Matthew, I completely disagree with you there. It is actually wrong to keep a prime minister in place who is achieving absolutely zilch, but do you think zero, the, nothing. Do you think the public who has tolerate? actually jettisoned all of the policies people voted for when they last went to the polls? But you just ignored what I've just sorry, said. Sorry. Well, do you think the public can really tolerate another leadership election in the context of everything Matthew's talking about? There's a cost of living crisis. There is a mass housing shortage. There is a homelessness crisis. Pretty much every and those school things are not being addressed. Exactly. And so, do you think the public would really look at a Conservative leadership contest and say, finally, they're taking this seriously? No, they wouldn't. They would think it's self indulgent, it's more infighting. And I, th I really think the Conservatives need to see this through with Rishi Sunak and spend some time in opposition. And quite frankly, let the adults sort it out because right now it looks like schoolyard bickering. And the public just do not have a tolerance for that anymore. But, but so, you're speaking as though. There is love out on the doorstep for Keir Starmer. You're speaking as though people want a Labour government and that. And as we know, that's just not the case. And the sad thing is that, you know, the Conservative Party are doing so badly under Rishi Sunak in the polls when the opposition is Captain well, Hindsight, that, yeah, which on. shows you how bad it is for us. Oh, Nadine, you say that, but look at the polling. Sorry, Matthew, I'm going to have to go to the break. So coming up <laughs> is Keir Starmer. I've done that too twice now. Is Keir Starmer a Prime Minister in waiting? After his speech on Tuesday, it's clear he certainly thinks so. Don't go anywhere. People of Britain. I have news. From Monday, the home of common sense is on the move. The Independent Republic of Mike Graham is coming to prime time, and it's about time too. We'll still be covering the stories that matter and putting the world to rights, but now we're in a brand new time slot, so don't miss the Independent Republic of Mike Graham weekday nights at 9pm, right after Piers Morgan Uncensored. Yes, the revolution will be televised. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. 
for the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> if you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. This is Talk TV. Welcome back to Friday Night with Nadine. On Tuesday, Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer made his pitch to be the next Prime Minister, saying the Conservatives are fighting like rats in a sack. You don't say. While they're swanning around self-importantly with their factions and their star chambers fighting like rats in a sack, there's a country out here that isn't being governed. A country that needs leadership. If in short, you want lower migration and higher wages, or even if you just want a government committed to economic stability, the rule of law, good public services, restoring Britain's standing, making family life more secure and putting the country first, then I say again, this is what a changed Labour Party will deliver. Some strong words from Starmer. But has he done enough to present himself as a, a credible alternative to Rishi Sunak? Joining me to discuss this is former Labour advisor and author of Labour's Revival and How to Win an Election, Paul Richards. Paul, was anyone listening? What do you... Is that going to turn things around for Keir? What did you make of his speech? Well, he's on a sort of year-long programme of introducing himself so to the British So that speech isn't going to be a game-changer. Well, it's, it's another step forward, but it is incremental. And, uh, you know, when it comes to the steps forward, it's in a mountain that he has to climb. He hasn't sealed the deal yet. That's fair. But I think people are now listening to him. They are open to the idea of a Labour government for the first time in many, many years. And are they, though? Do they, are they open to a Labour government because they want one? or because they're so disaffected with the Conservative Party that they feel they have nowhere else to well, go? Well, I mean, that's why I don't believe the polls. I say to my Labour colleagues, this is not a done deal. It's not all over. There's a lot of work still to do. Uh, but he's made incredible strides in, what, three years, with, you know, in taking out the COVID year um, from the worst defeat in 1935 under Corbyn to where we are now, where people are at least talking about the prospect of a Labour government and it isn't terrifying people. But Paul, they were during Corbyn's days. That's why it was so terrifying. I mean, people were talking about a Corbyn government. You know, we had news presenters on Channel 4, you know, heralding the idea that there'd be a Corbyn well, government, an anti-Semitic Corbyn yeah. government. It was terrifying. I first met Jeremy Corbyn in the 80s and I knew full well he was never going to be a prime minister. And I was telling everyone at the time, uh, the polls, you know, don't believe them. I think some of the commentators got a bit carried away. 
But I mean, there was never a serious prospect. And in fact, 2019, when people thought there might be a prospect, that's when they turned against him in such record numbers. So for Starmer to come back from that near-death experience to where we are now is an amazing achievement. But like I say, he hasn't sealed the deal. There is still uh, time ahead of an election. And the polls can be all over the place, as we know. Do we believe polls? No, we don't. Well, I, well so I do, actually, because I don't think there's an election in recent years where the polls have been out. So, but... But, you know, the Labour Party are behaving very well at the moment because they have to. They have to hold it together. Yeah, but you and I both know there's a discipline which is holding with difficulty at the moment because you and I both know that the Labour Party has its own factions internally. Mm. When I look at the face of Andrew, uh, Angela Rayner sat at PMQs, so I think, which, which day are you going to explode? Which day is the split? We're going to hear that rip come down the middle between her and, her and Starmer. We know they are holding it together with effort to get well, to the general election. I think Angela Rayner is actually a very loyal deputy in the sort of John Prescott mould, not, not from the same wing as the oh, leader, but on the other I'm hand, somebody sure. prepared to step up and serve um, in a way that, that Prescott did. Now, in terms of other factions, you know, he Starmer has acted incredibly strongly uh, uh, with great strength against his own internal critics and he's got rid of the Corbynites largely, uh, including Corbyn himself. So and these people will the not be candidates for the that's next election. The trouble is brewing though, isn't it? It's brewing amongst the left of the party. Yeah. I mean, he said two weeks ago, he said words of praise about Margaret Thatcher. Well, in context, come on. I mean, that's the oldest trick in the book, to take one line out. He also praised Attlee uh, and Blair and Thatcher. So he's on the side of reforming prime ministers of whatever stripe. But I do you not know, go the, down well with his own Well, party. I think when it comes to those factions to the left, I would say all the right people are leaving and all the right people are joining the Labour Party at the moment. So the money is coming back. Some of the businesses are looking again at Labour. A lot of the public are looking again at Labour. And the sort of the hard left is out the door. So he's doing all the right things, but there's still more to do. And that's the key point. Do you know, I remember having a drink with John Reid once and him saying to me... More than one, I suspect. No, no, well, actually, it was, it, was, it was coffee in the morning, to be honest. <laughs> and I remember him saying to me in the fusion room, the trouble with our party is we get things back on track. We, we, we get back behind the driving seat and then the trots come along and they take the wheels off the bus. And well, it happens every time. Absolutely. And there is, uh, Labour has enemies to the left um, as well as to the right. And I think that's an important point to remember. But I think Stum has done a lot in terms of I mean, all the internal stuff that nobody notices or cares about, but the important stuff around who runs the national executive and who the candidates are in the next election and enforcing discipline and kicking out the anti semites and all those things. You know, Stum has done all that tough work. Yeah, and but that's he's why also, he's in a good position but now. But Paul, he's also doing what leaders of opposition do. He can say anything he wants and he's unaccountable at the moment. So he's made a, a comment this week that he's going to end the psychodrama of immigration without a single word about how. If he doesn't think that every civil servant in the Home Office and every politician mm. who's been in the Home Office has tried to do that over the last 10 years, then he's been asleep because everybody has been trying to do that. Now, surely if he says, I'm going to end the psychodrama of of inward migration, mm. then what he needs to do is say how he's going to do it to be plausible mm. and for people to believe him. So why hasn't he said how? Well, on illegal immigration, of course, Yvette Cooper has set out a fairly robust plan. No, no, it's not including, robust. It's, it's, it's we're going to, we're going to those start gangs. Gang. smashing how, the gangs. How to smash the gangs? Well, do, they not think, can... do they not think the entire police force and the Home Office and have been trying to do that. I don't think and they have given enough resource to it. And I think also, you know, the point Yvette's making is you've got to stop the boats before they even get to the channel. You know, you disrupt the supply chain in France of those boats. If you stop and you the boats... think no-one's been trying to do that. Yeah, that, that's that, right. That that's France why they're still has not coming. been given huge amounts of money yeah. to stop that happening and to actually police their own borders you know, and fail. I think there's a little bit of... Despite taking many bucks from the UK taxpayer to make that happen. I think there's a little bit of ideological well, what, resistance gonna... to dealing with the French and, and the Belgian authorities in a collegiate way so because of our own government. what do you think he is going to government. do then? Well, I think he's going to do the I mean, he you, said. I, I mean, you're, you're gonna... using top-line words again. He's going to deal with people leaving France in the first place. How? Well, he's going to do the five-point plan that Yvette set out. And, of course, you know, when you get into government, you can see the real levers and you can but put again, the money where it needs nothing, to be. There's... So what you've got is nothing coming from across the channel. 
you don't have anybody no. from across the channel saying, th we actually buy into this five-point plan and we think we can work with Labour I to don't deliver think this. Keir Starmer hasn't said he's going to end all immigration, has he? Or even or end all illegal immigration, but he is going to have a renewed focus and a tackling it. And I think that's fair. Um, and I think across a range of policy areas, people are saying, well, OK, let's, let's try the other lot. Let's give them a go. And it can't be any worse than the nonsense we had, had to put up with the last few years. And that's why there is this openness, I think, to Starmer. Um, you know, he may not be the guy you want to go for a, a drink with or have at your Christmas party. He's a little bit dull. Um, he's an administrator. He's not... But I think a little bit of stability. Wouldn't it be lovely if we had a whole day where there's no politics in the news at all? And people just get on with their lives and we don't have to worry about what the government well, is doing. It's just, it's just doing its job. And I think that's what Starmer offers. It's just a little bit of a stability and a decent government just getting on with it. Wouldn't that be lovely? So you're absolutely right, Paul. That would be absolutely lovely because some of us would get a day off. But <laughs> the problem is that now that we have Twitter and social media mm. and Facebook and 24-7 rolling news, that will never happen again. Politics will be in our lives every single day mm. with a psychodrama of some sort of another. Zoe, no, Matthew, I have to go to you next because mm -hmm. I kind of like have cut you out the last two times. So, Matthew, how do you think, what do you think Keir Starmer can do to, to make those words mean something, to end the psychodrama? It's got to be... What could he say tomorrow that people would make? Because nobody believes him when he says it. Well, you, what do you think he could say tomorrow? You, you say nobody believes him, but Labour has been polling consistently well. Polling in the 40s, they've had, no, roughly, they've they've had roughly a 20% gap between them and the Conservatives for a long time. So this idea that people are just turning against the Tories and just won't turn, turn out and that, and that will gift Labour victory, I, I don't buy that. I do think reform are a major threat to the right, but I also think that there's probably a growing population in this country who do want to give Labour a chance. Keir Starmer has rinsed the party of the toxicity that meant that people like me and many people watching might think I'm some sort of hard lefty. I'm not. I couldn't vote for Labour when Jeremy Corbyn was leader. So in 2017 and 2019, I took my vote elsewhere. I can now, with a clear conscience, vote for the Labour Party. And that is, I hope, massive. I think Labour could win a considerable majority, but I agree with Paul. The nitty-gritty is going to be incredibly tough. And there is a risk, because if Starmer does not deliver, and there's a chance that he won't, that the challenges facing him are very, very difficult. It is right, it is going to be hard to stop those boats. And if he doesn't deliver, then there is a real risk of a lurch to the hard right in this country two years or so into his premiership. Mm. And that is actually going to be the big question. He'll be challenged on that very quickly. So it's not like Keir Starmer will become Prime Minister and he'll have five years to deliver on that promise. People will be looking for deliveries on that promise within six months. And that social media point, I think, is very true. I think in the social media age, when you're being attacked all the time by <coughs> activists, sometimes by journalists, by other politicians, minute by minute, actually, I think that's part of the reason why we've had such a quick turnover of Prime Ministers at the head of the, the Tory party. It's partly been their own incompetence, it's partly been about fractures and failures at the heart of government, but it's also about this increased level of scrutiny where we can all do that scrutinising. So this is not going to be easy for Starmer. It's going to be very hard work, but I think his speech this week was a plausible bid to be the next Prime Minister of this country. Zoe, what do you think, just in a few words, what do you think Starmer could say that would make people think, I believe him, he is going to stop the boats? Well, I think setting out more detail in a plan is helpful. I think you're right, at the minute, everything's quite vague, but it's how you would expect it to be. If you reveal too much, it gets stolen by the government for their manifesto. Um, and also, they're not the government. They don't have to, at the minute, stop the boats. And they that's fine for now. But when we so get to more detail. the lead yeah. up to a general election, that doesn't hold for We need more longer. detail. And that is to be expected in a manifesto and during any kind of general election debates. I think Starmer is doing a good job at making himself look safe and secure. And I think one of the things that's been lacking in this country for a number of years is security. Uh, people do not feel like their wages are secure. People do not feel like their housing is secure. And Labour's doing a really good job of presenting themselves as, OK, a boring party, but a party that isn't going to suddenly mess things up with a insane mini budget or fight with each other and, and i think people want i've got to we've got to go to break in a second thank you for that paul thanks for coming in and chatting to us this evening i um you know leaseholder reform which was a policy that we had absolutely gutted to see that one jettisoned also yeah. coming up david cameron says the heat and anger has gone from the uk eu relationship does he want to reverse brexit
both for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using Excel bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. This is Talk TV. Welcome back to Friday Night with Nadine. For some time now, it's felt like the relationship between the UK and the EU has been slightly on the rocks. Issues like trade, migration, of course, Brexit has strained relations. But have we turned a corner? Lord Cameron seems to think so. Well, I would say that um, the relations are positive and, you know, driving quite good results in the areas where we want to have them. And, and I think it's been interesting coming back to see how it's working and how problems are being fixed and opportunities are be being taken. I think a lot of the heat and, and um, anger has come out of the relationship. It's now much more functional uh, and I think it's functioning well. The new Foreign Secretary was addressing a House of Lords committee where he added the UK wanted to be the EU's friend, neighbour and partner. I think that's always been the case. Still with me in the studio are Policy and Politics correspondent at the New Statesman, Zoe Grunwald, and author and broadcaster, Matthew Stadlin. So, Zoe, did you agree with David Graham? It seems to be stating the obvious, we've, even throughout Brexit, we've always wanted to be the EU's friend and partner. I think, uh, yeah, I think it's the natural progression of, of relations with the EU was always going to get to this point where we would have to be working slightly close with them, particularly on issues like migration, where actually one of the only ways we can really um, fix the small boats crisis is by closer ties with the EU. You know, we need to have closer ties with France. We, um, we know that behind the scenes, Labour and the Conservatives have both been exploring the possibility of returns agreements. So it was always going to be the case. And I think a lot you can do a lot of posturing about 
we don't want anything to do with the EU and uh, Britain works just fine on its own. It doesn't. It needs to cooperate with international partners. Um, we are an island, but we can't do things by ourselves. We very much need to work with other countries. We're an island, but we're a sovereign island. Matthew, what do you think of what he has yeah, to say? Well, you've got uh, you guys who, vo who voted for Brexit and led the Brexit charge, have at least to some extent got what you wanted. I think whether in the highly unlikely event that the Conservatives win the next election with David Cameron still as foreign secretary, there's no way we're going to be rejoining the EU. And in the much more likely event that Keir Starmer's Labour wins the next election, we're also not going to be rejoining the EU. This is just about simple grown-up politics, whether it's with America, whether it's with the EU or other parts of the world. These are massive power players. And of course, we have to have really good, strong relationships with them. And although this is not going to be an election simply about small boats, we're in a cost of living crisis, we're in a, a, built, a house, housing crisis and all sorts of other crises, not leads the NHS waiting list. Mm. Nonetheless, on issues such as the small boats, as you say, it is critical that we have as good relations and as civil relations as we possibly can with the EU. And the fact that Starmer doesn't carry the baggage of Brexit, I think, will help him. Now, that is an important point. He's not seen as being the party that delivered Brexit. Or, but, however, that should not stand in the way of good relations, particularly not when we've got Putin invading Ukraine, when we've had a pandemic which has resulted in a global rise in interest rates, hence the inflation. We're all suffering a similar pain and similar problems. I mean, I know the media focuses a lot on cost of living here and inflation and mortgage rates. The whole of the EU is suffering the same pain that we do. And there is, as grown-ups and as countries who have mutual enemies in, in, and adversaries, surely it shouldn't be about Brexit. It should just be about representing what is what is important to all of us, to, to stand as a, a sharing, you know, the, the, the same values. Why would Brexit actually, it shouldn't get in the way of that, should it? Because we, we're democratic. So we voted to leave, we've left, we shouldn't be punished for that. And now there's any other country that does that. I, in the future I, don't, either. I, I don't think that we are your sort of target audience for that particular complaint. I think if you have such a complaint that you probably have to go across the channel and have a word to the French. And no doubt, and I voted for Remain, but no doubt there has been a, a sort of punitive element in relations with us since Brexit. And that's why I say, and I say it again, that I think a fresh government, a, a Labour government that isn't tainted in the eyes of Europeans by Brexit, could get more business done. And, and we, we talked earlier about wouldn't it be amazing not, not having to listen about politics all the time. This is about being a grown-up and about having grown-up relations with our major allies. Well, I think it was poorly said that. You know, the, the one reason, the one way I experienced this kind of like almost childish, revengeful attitude from the EU is when I was Secretary of State, we, we opened our doors to all travelling musicians from across the EU. They were all welcome to come here and to gig here and to go back. All 27 states put different restrictions in place for EU for UK musicians and made it very put a cabotage in place, made it very difficult for until the summer came and the festival season, and then suddenly they realised they'd made a big mistake. And that's that's the problem with dealing with the EU. It just needs for everybody to behave like grown-ups. And I hope what David Cameron was referring to was the fact that people are prepared in the EU to just behave like grown-ups now that Brexit's happened. Now, Gary Lineker has landed himself in yet another impartiality round this week with his BBC employers. Is it time for him to go? Zoe? Well, I think it's, it's been a difficult um, ride for Gary Lineker, hasn't it? Because increasingly he's been very vocal about his political views. Um, and although the guidance was pretty um, ambiguous, shall, I, shall we say, about his particular role as a sports presenter um, and what he could and couldn't say online, I think now it has been strengthened slightly. I would argue it's still probably not as strong as the critics would want it to be. I think if they really want it to be decisive about what Lineker can say, they should strengthen it even more. Um, however, I do think think in the, having provo been provocative um, on social media towards politicians, making an issue far bigger, possibly igniting a bit of a spat. I think just you would maybe not want to do that in terms of the optics. I think the BBC is under a lot of fire at the minute for its role in um, for how impartial it is. And I think if I were Lineker, I probably wouldn't want to feed that fire. I do think he's entitled to his political opinions, um, but I think there's a certain way you can express those that with tact and grace. 
But as you'll know, Zoe, um, because you were a civil servant in what was my former department, the BBC had to go, because it's been identified as having a lack of impartiality, it had to go through the Dyson Review. And as a result of the Dyson Review, only two years ago, it had to issue an impartiality plan, which those who work for the BBC have to abide by. Otherwise, it really puts the licence fee in serious legal jeopardy over at the BBC. Uh, uh, yeah, and that's my point. I think we, most of us, uh, and me included, love the BBC. I think it has a really valuable part to play in our, in our society, in the infrastructure in Britain. And I would hate to see it be undermined and by giving critics of it ammunition to undermine it and undermine the important purpose it has. Yeah. And I think if I were Lineker, that's I would be more tactful about the I way think, I express well, myself. I'll go further than you. I think that's why Lineker has to go because he's a repeat offender. It's happened over and over again. I think what's happening now is that Tim Davey, who's Director General of the BBC and the new incoming chair, are just going to look weak if they don't do something about it. If I, if I were Tim Davey, I'd be absolutely furious with Lineker. Mm. And I think he has done damage to the brand. I'm quite unusual in my echo chamber in that I'm not a fan of Gary Lineker, and he is not a fan of me, by the way. <laughs> but I think going, go, going <laughs> head to head with, with MPs, even if they've gone after mm. you in some way, going head to head with MPs, you are pitting yourself against a political party, at least in the eye of the beholder. And I think it was really, really unwise. It might give him an adrenaline hit, a dopamine hit for a while as the likes pile up from the echo chamber that I share with him, even though he's he's blocked me. Nonetheless, it is damaging to the BBC. Have we all blocked it's you? I've blocked you. You blocked me as well. I was astonishing you. that you we follow, we follow each other. But no, I think he's overstepped the mark. And because he has previously been suspended, I have to say, I, I, no one wants anyone to lose a job, although he'd be probably all right if he, if he doesn't continue to have this Willie, particular Willie. job. Because if he hasn't got the platform of the BBC, doesn't he just become another house being footballer? I just can't see how he can keep his job or should keep his job. The, B, the, the, the BBC has come under severe attack, not least from you when you were culture secretary and the last thing it needs is its high profile stars being given too many chances well so i take your points and thank you both of you but i really think you're quite right matthew he's put the brand in danger he's and i think he's put tim davy in a position where he has no option now i'd be furious if i were tim he's actually put him in a really difficult position tim has no option but to take strong action so that brings us to the end of tonight's show. Thank you for joining me and thank you to Zoe and Matthew. So hope to see you. Have a lovely Christmas. Have a lovely Have Christmas, a lovely Christmas too, to Nadine, everybody. Yeah. And that's it from Friday Night with Nadine. It's the world's number one interview show, the new global home of big debates and big questions. This is really unfair. Why? We'll explain why. For all the big names. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. You're going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, of course, I cannot continue my work. Did you feel Elvis was a controlling influence on you? And the good news? You've already found it. All new Piers Morgan Uncensored, right here, Monday to Thursday, 8 p.m. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? 
Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> If you're